Okay, um, just for the sake of time and to respect everyone's time, um, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, we have not locked the room, um, so if anyone uh, continues to join, they'll, they'll be able to. Um, so again, welcome um, to this two-part virtual keynote presentation by Herman Aguinness. Um, before we begin, I just have a couple of housekeeping items that I wanted to cover. Um, first, please be aware that this session um, will be recorded. Um, second, by default, everyone is on mute. Um, we ask that you don't unmute yourselves. Um, we are going to have everyone ask the questions in the chat box um, that's right in the Zoom uh, window. Um, if you have any problems with that, please just let us know. Um, we AOM staff will be monitoring it uh, as well as Herman. Um, so we'll be keeping an eye, an eye on that. Um, and I guess now, without uh, any further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our keynote speaker, Herman Aguinness. Not that he needs an introduction, but we will give him a formal one anyway. <laughs> um, Herman Aguinness is the Avram Tucker Distinguished Scholar and Professor of Management at the George Washington University School of Business. His research addresses the acquisition of development of talent um, in organizations and organizational research methods. His recent projects address star performance, corporate social responsibility, and business sustainability, domestic and international workforce diversity, leadership, staffing, training and development, performance management, and innovative methodological approaches for development, developing and testing theories. He has been elected for the presidency track of the Academy of Management um, and is currently serving as the AOM Vice President and Program Chair. Professor Aguinness has published nine books, um, written 165 refereed journal articles, and delivered close to 300 keynote addresses and presentations at professional conferences. The 2019 and 2018 Web of Science highly cited research reports ranked him among the world's top 100 most impactful researchers in economics and business, and his work has received more than 30,000 Google Scholar citations. His professional and life agenda is to have an impact on the academic community, but also on society at large. For more information, please visit hermanaginnis.com. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, welcome everyone. I see a lot of friends. Hola Ernesto, Alberto, hello everybody. Good to see you. Uh, I see some people who have turned off their, their webcam. If you want to turn it on, that's, that's up to you. Um, if you do, we'll be able to interact uh, better. But first of all, I want to thank you for attending this uh, session and, and acknowledge that this is a really, really hard time for everybody. And on a professional level, on a personal level, um, I see it from my leadership role in the Academy of Management. Hello, Mary, we can see you now. Uh, and I see it also from a personal standpoint, uh, uh, given that we have uh, two teenage daughters locked up in the, in the house. So every day is, uh, is an interesting challenge. My wife and I are dealing with the, the personal issues of that. And I know everyone is going through similar issues. So I really appreciate that you're here today. And uh, if you see the, uh, the options on, the, on, on Zoom, you can see there's an option to raise your hand. Um, and there's also an option to say yes or no. Uh, do you see those? Great. So let's start with a little uh, raise your hand thing. Uh, raise your hand if you have if you had a chance to watch the uh, the keynote that I recorded a few days ago. Okay. Thumbs up. That means you watched it and you liked it. Just. Okay, great. Thank you, Alberto. Uh, Leaf. Okay, thank you. Okay, very good. So most of you watched it. If you haven't, um, check it out. It's it's online. Um, and these are really unprecedented times uh, because of, of COVID-19. But as I said in the keynote, there was one issue that I noticed that is also very unique, which is you turn on the TV and you watch people talk about science. You watch people debate data. You see PowerPoint slides on TV. Uh, you see graphs with trends. And you watch doctors debate which model is more credible. 
who's who's going to flatten the curve faster which state which country what are they doing to flatten the curve and these are literally life or death decisions that are being made with data originating originated in scientific studies and i have to say that i've been, I've been trying to look at the bright side of things there aren't many of this situation but one of them is i see an overall societal um, acceptance and eagerness to hear from scientists to learn what is science uh, saying and how can science help us uh, during this time which is really encouraging very very encouraging because we know in particular in management there's a huge gap between science and practice which means the science that we produce is now being used by practitioners by managers or in this case policy makers in general and one of the reasons is that often the practitioners do not trust the research that's, that is being produced and in fact you see that played out on tv as well in the last few days i heard people questioning some of the models to say well this model was wrong and that prediction was wrong and i don't know who should trust the scientists so much anymore because they don't know what they're talking about so it went from love to hate to love it's going back and forth but but the positive takeaway is that people are debating science and the credibility of science and that is something very close to home very close to home because we know that there are many studies that have been done in management in applied psychology and economics showing that our research is very difficult to replicate if someone tries to do the same study that somebody else did it is very unlikely you will get the same results it's very unlikely you will get the same conclusions so going back to COVID-19 if you have two teams of researchers and one says we should lift the lockdown based on my prediction based on my model by this date if you give the same data or you let some other team of researchers do the same analysis will they reach the same conclusion i mean this is a really 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 important issue we're not dealing with a minor thing we're dealing about the pop with the possibility that if you make the wrong decision many people will die and also if you make the wrong decision the economy will continue to tank so these are really monumental decisions based on data so what we did in our research in the last decade or so is try to enhance the credibility of our research given that we know that management research is very difficult to, to replicate so let me start with a little thought experiment and then i'm going to open up the dialogue for any questions comments um suggestions you may have um, let's let's do a thought experiment let's imagine that you just read an article in the latest issue of of your favorite journal okay now think about that one paper let's not make it abstract or or general just think about one article one article that you just read okay all of you are at home so you've been reading a lot so think about that one paper that you just read okay good so this paper is about a topic that you know. Obviously, you're interested in that topic. That's why you read that paper. So think about that specific article. And now, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if you can answer yes to the following question about that one paper that you read in a really good journal on a topic that you, that you like and you know. Raise your hand if you are convinced that the authors of that article reported openly and transparently all data collection and all data cleaning procedures. For example, how they handle outliers, how they dealt with control variables, how they handle missing data. So go to Zoom and raise your hand if you feel you're convinced that the authors of this article reported openly and transparently, transparently all details about data collection and cleaning raise your hand if yes okay not one okay raise your hand if you do not believe that they reported all of those procedures openly and transparently raise your hand if you do not believe that they reported on zoom oh you can do it like that too <laughs> that's fine <laughs> okay so a hundred percent consensus 
a hundred percent consensus that you believe that you're not convinced that the authors reported everything transparently. Okay, question number two. Think about that paper again, okay? This is a paper you, you just read. Raise your hand on Zoom if you're convinced that the authors reported all analyses fully and transparently. For example, if they had some models and they used different predictors in the model, some were added, some were taken out, uh, maybe they dropped different variables from the model early on, maybe they had many more variables and some were not reported in the end. So raise your hand if you feel that all of the analyses that the authors conducted were reported in the paper fully and transparently. Go ahead with Zoom. I see heads nodding, thumbs down. Okay, raise your hand if you do not believe that the authors reported all of the analyses fully and transparently. Raise your hand if you do not believe they reported transparently everything. Okay. So again, except Umer didn't, Oscar, Elizabeth, okay, a couple of hands I didn't see, but okay, I see a hand now. Okay, so again, we have 100% consensus that you do not believe, you're not convinced that the authors reported all the analysis. Question number three, are you convinced that the authors reported all the results um, fully and transparently? For example, they may have uh, found that some hypotheses are not supported, did they report that? They may have found that some statistical results were not statistically significant. Did they report that as well? Are you fully convinced that the authors reported all the results? Raise your hand. Okay, raise your hand if you think that the authors did not report all the results fully. Again, again, again. And I'm going to ask you just one last and fourth question. Okay, think about that paper again. And this is not about that one paper in particular. This is, this is in general, but I'm making this point because all of you, I'm sure you've read different papers and yet you all agree on these issues. Number four, raise your hand if you think that if you try to conduct this same study, you would obtain the same results, the same effect size estimates, the same levels of statistical significance, meaning the same p-values as those reported in that article. Raise your hand if you're convinced that you would obtain the same, the same results. Raise your hand if you think you would not obtain the same results and conclusions. Okay. Uh, Leaf, or is that, did I pronounce your name right? Leaf or Life? Yeah. So I didn't see your hand. So, so are, do you think that you will get the same results if you do the same study? Yes. You agree. You would be able to replicate the results. Okay. Maybe. Okay. So we had a hundred percent agreement on the first three questions and, and almost full agreement, but not complete in the last question. So if we all believe, most of us believe, and we're going to discuss this next, but we, most of us believe that the, the authors did not report all the data collection and cleaning procedures fully. If, if we do not believe that the authors reported all their analyses fully, that they were not fully transparent in terms of the results they found, there's no hope in, in trying to try to do the same study and obtain the same results because half of the stuff the authors did, you just don't know what they did. So I'm not saying they cheated. I'm not saying they faked the data or anything. I'm just saying that research is not sufficiently transparent so that there are many judgment calls being made that we're not aware of. So when we try to do the same uh, study, we cannot get the same results. For example, let's take this back to COVID-19. We're looking at different data sets from Germany, from Italy, from the United States. And in some countries, they say our number of deaths are a lot, a lot uh, lower than in these other countries. 
we have the same thing within states in the United States. And and then some people say, okay, yeah, I, I buy it. So probably you're doing something, you're doing something there in the country that is reducing the number of deaths. Maybe you're catching people early before they develop symptoms or, or things like that. But the other day I heard someone, a researcher on TV saying, I think that the authors of the study did not explain exactly how they measured number of deaths and what caused somebody's death. Was it COVID-19? or they came into the hospital because they had some other condition and also they had COVID-19. But the data were collected and measured as if COVID-19 were the reason for the death, where, in, where it could be the tipping point, or it could be that the person had diabetes and three other things, but they only counted COVID-19 as the one reason. So that's lack of transparency in the measures, in how the data were collected. So if you do not know exactly how the data were collected, you don't know if the conclusions are trustworthy. So we see that in management all the time. We use databases and we don't really know how ROA was measured. You look at two databases and you look at the same company and the, and the value for uh, return on assets or ROI for the same company are different. How could that be? So what did the database use to compute those numbers? We don't know. And if we don't know, we cannot reproduce. Okay, so I'm going to stop now and open up the dialogue for any questions, um, any, any comments you may have. You can go ahead and, uh, and type in the chat box, but we are not that many people today. So if you'd like to go ahead and, and, and talk, that would be great as well. You can just go ahead and unmute your, your mic. It would be better if you raise your hand first uh, and, then, and then Carly can unmute you because if we have five people unmuted at the same time, um, so Carly, would you please handle the issue of unmuting? I think Yvette was the first one who raised her hand. Hello. Uh, Yvette Mucharras from IPADE. I'm in Mexico, like Alberto. Uh, it's a, a real pleasure to meet you. Uh, I, I, as I was reflecting after looking at the video you sent us, uh, and also through this reflection that you share with us, Herman, I also believe in one one part of it is, of course, there, there there may be some, I don't know if it's intentional or unintentional errors or how the research is reported, but at the same time, I believe that uh, the way many journals um, provide guidelines also present some constraints for researchers to report that. And, and, and I want to, to, to be clear in, in the sense of, uh, for example, there is a limit in the number of words that, uh, that have to include literature review, the hypothesis or research questions, also uh, the discussion of the results, and there is a limit. So, and I completely agree with you, but I also have this in, in the back of my head and I don't know how to reconcile those ideas. The, there can be some uh, things to improve, but at the same time, the system uh, that many journals apply to filter the papers and be able to publish uh, also presents uh, all these challenges. Thank you, Yvette. That is a, that is a great, great question. This is not just up to the individual author and the, the researcher. Before I give you my, my uh, observations on that point, let me uh, ask Jose Ernesto to give you his thoughts because he is the editor-in-chief of Management Research, which is the journal of the Ibero-American Academy of Management. As an editor, he will be able to, to share some thoughts uh, with you on that issue. Would you mind, Ernesto? Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Herman, and, and hello to everyone. I'm Ernesto Moros. I'm also in Mexico City, working for EGADE Business School, Tecnológico de Monterrey. Yeah, um, it's it's very relevant uh, try to um, understand this uh, phenomenon that is not not only in in, in management science in, or, or in social science. It's it's very common in in other type of science. Uh, that um, we probably we don't trust so much in some procedures uh, 
in the accountability of our research process and obviously uh, the outcomes, the, the, the results of many, many research are comas uh, uh, in, 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 the, in the mind or in the scope of, 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 of the lack of credibility. No? Uh, frequently we, 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 we have this problem. Uh, sometimes uh, this impetus to, 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 to have uh, something that we consider is novelty or or the pressure that pressure that we have to, to publish uh, some of our research uh, uh, don't don't give us the possibility to expand, for example, uh, some of the results or, or make more transparent uh, uh, some of the the issues that we make in in our empirical uh, settings and so on. No, but. But now, because the, 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 the reality that we are facing uh, around the, uh, not only related with COVID-19, because obviously this is something that is extraordinary in, in, in all sense, but again, in, in, uh, for our science, for our own credibility, we need to be more and more and more open and more and more critics about what exactly we are doing and what exactly are the results of our our research that could create something that will be with impact for our stakeholders, something that will be more actionable, and again and again convert these comas, uh, vices, uh, uh, circles in something that will be more positive and 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 move forward uh, our research uh, to regain or retake the credibility that that we have and now because the current situation we the science uh, the people that are producing science need to be more in upfront in order to to uh, to inform to our uh, different uh, audiences our different stakeholders with the data with credibility the things that that, that we need to share with with them okay and as as Herman mentioned, me as as a, a chief editor of a journal, we are now moving forward this type of things. Okay, probably will be better if you have something that is simple, that is something that is transparent, and 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 try to make more value to these pieces of research. That something that probably it's complex with a lot of the statistics, with a lot of numbers that. If you are not transparent, we cannot replicate. Probably this type of research uh, will be have less and less value. Um, it's a trade-off, obviously. Uh, it's something that we need to consider, like academia, uh, the balance between quality and and quantity. But we are now together moving forward this type of thing. So we are living a, a very critical moment, but also in the positive way. It's a unique opportunity to to put more in front in the spotlight the necessity to to be more transparent the replication credibility and accuracy of our research thank you that's that's really great that's really really great uh anybody has any any answers or, or comments on uh on yvette's question and then i'll go after that but i'd like to hear from someone else is anyone a member of a board uh for a journal is anybody a reviewer for a journal? Have you reviewed papers for a journal recently as a reviewer? Mary says yes. Alberto says yes. Why don't you tell us, because Ernesto talked about the editor's perspective and the journal's perspective. So from a perspective of, of a reviewer or board member, board member, uh, we have heard and I have seen myself, sometimes, uh, for example, a reviewer, and this is directly related to Yvette's comment saying, hey, hypothesis three was not supported. Take it out. The paper is already very long. If that hypothesis was not supported, just take it out of the paper. You have an extra half a page or so to, to, to describe the hypothesis that were supported. Um, so uh, I think in, in many fields, knowing that something didn't work is informative. But sometimes the reviewers feel that that is not interesting or novel. So we can take that out. So Alberto, Mary, you know, any, any of you who is a member of the board or has reviewed a paper recently, what do you think about that? Uh, hi, uh, Alberto here. 
So yeah, I mean, I, I mean, that's also part of the question. <coughs> I'm sorry, the question that I put in the chat. Um, well, the, obviously, there's a tendency to report what what was uh, somehow proven or if not proven, at least what was tested and had successful answers in the um, in the journals. So I don't really even have an answer to that. So how how do we overcome this tendency to just to try to uh, share what was confirmed? Uh, by by the testing, uh, and obviously by leaving out everything that didn't work or that wasn't confirmed, then we're not allowing further scholars to to build upon our work, right? Because I'm thinking a lot, like for example, papers that are based on experiments. Uh, how much money time can be saved if if people share how their experiments didn't didn't achieve the results that were expected because whatever. The, the the sample the question the method the uh, anything right so uh, I I I think I don't have an answer and I just want to build upon my concern that I I also share that perspective. Thank you for sharing that. Anyone else uh, who has recently reviewed a paper, maybe for a conference, maybe uh, one of you reviewed a paper for the uh, for the conference in in Mexico or for the Academy of Management conference in Vancouver. Raise your hand. Mary, go ahead, please. Yes, I did review for this conference and also for the annual AOM meeting in Vancouver. And um, I think also I've been helping my advisor who is an editor go through and sort of organize the system to see which papers are nominated for the best conceptual paper for a different, um, work stream within AOM or best empirical paper or different subcategories. So I think there's an element of, from my perspective as a PhD student, there's, you have to be obviously highly ethical in the review process, but also there's some judgment involved. Um, and I guess the judgment part is where it gets a little bit tricky. I, I went, um, to Georgetown for my master's in Latin American studies and I just listened to a, a seminar about judgment and truth in the legal system in in the border um, between the US and Mexico um, in some of the different legal questions. So this this discrepancy between truth, causation, and, and then judgment I think is is interesting. But one thing I guess that I would conclude with is just the so what question of, of research. Why are we doing this and what is the contribution to theory or method? So it's a good spot to be in. Okay, thank you, Mary. Uh, fortunately, um, in, in HR, human resource management and organizational behavior, we have many theories that help us understand human behavior. And if you think about an author, uh, being transparent or not, that's choice behavior. Uh, if you think of a reviewer telling the author to remove a hypothesis, that's behavior that also involves a choice. And the editor obviously has a big responsibility and choice in accepting or rejecting a paper. And so the question is, why do people behave in certain ways? And why do people perform in a very high wet level or a very low level. So if you talk about, for example, a performance of, a, of an athlete, you, you see an athlete performing at a very, very high level or a very poor level. And if you can see, a, think about a researcher, uh, you think of a research performance uh, at a high level or a low level. You can also think about editorial performance or reviewer performance. Is a reviewer performing at a high level or a low level? And what are the factors that that determine high or low level of performance across all of these occupations, sports, being a researcher, being an editor. And there are two major factors that the HR and OB literature tells us exist. One is abilities. You need to know how to do the job well. So if you're an author, you need to know how to do the research well. You need to know how to be transparent. You need to know how to clean your data. You need to know how you check the assumptions. Um, if you're a reviewer, 
you also need to have abilities as a reviewer. For example, you have to be able to spot potential problems in the paper. Uh, and as an editor, the same thing. But there's also the second factor, which is motivation. You need to want to do the job well, much like an athlete. An athlete needs to be able to have the physical strength to run the race or swim, but you also need to want to win that race and swim very fast. So as a researcher, you need to know how to be transparent, but you need to also want to <laughs> be transparent. And why would you or would you not want to be transparent? Well, if being transparent means that my paper will be published, that I will get a pay raise next year, that I will get a promotion, that I will get tenure, then obviously I'll be very motivated to be transparent because all these wonderful things will happen. But if I am not transparent and then my research looks good because it's clean, I have effects that are mostly statistically significant, I have large effects, and that's what gives me all the goodies, there's a very strong motivation to be non-transparent. So it doesn't matter if I know how to clean the data and how to be transparent. What matters is that maybe the motivation to do those things are not there. So it's both a combination of abilities and motivation. So how can we improve the abilities of researchers through methods training mostly, through training on how to be a top-notch researcher? But as I mentioned in my, in my presentation, I don't know if in other countries it's happening as well, but in the United States, the, the competition in higher education is, is brutal. Competition for students, for enrollment, and from a dean's perspective, and the deans typically stay maybe five, seven years, eight max at a given university. Uh, if you're looking at your balance sheet and you're thinking, I'm going to put a, a full professor or a chair professor to teach four or five doctoral students who do not pay or pay very little versus I'm gonna put that person in a classroom with 50 MBA students who pay a lot from a pure uh, accounting perspective, the dean might choose to put the person in, in the MBA classroom, another in a doctoral classroom, which means that doctoral students get less and less training, less methodological training. And then you're faced with the tenure clock. You're faced with that decision on whether you will get tenure and you will be promoted or not. And if you do not have enough publications, the, the outcome will be no, you don't get any of those things. And how do you get published if you don't know how to do research well? you start cutting corners because you don't know how to do it because you didn't get the training. So that's the lack of abilities part. And the lack of motivation, here's where the system plays an important role. The editors, the reviewers, in terms of motivating authors to be more transparent, creating systems through which transparency is rewarded, not punished, not punished. If you feel you're gonna be punished from showing your cards, and revealing that half of your hypotheses were not supported, you feel that if you're truthful, the paper will be rejected, what are you going to do? You're a fifth year assistant professor. In eight months, you're going to be reviewed for tenure. If you publish one more paper, you get tenure. If you don't publish that paper, you don't get tenure. Meaning you have to get a job at another university, maybe move your family out of state, sell your house, buy another house somewhere else, versus covering up that two of the hypotheses did not work. And it's not truly a lie, you're just not talking about it. So from the perspective of, of, of a researcher in that position, the motivation is very, very strong to not report things that might lead to a decision to reject your paper. Because if the paper is accepted, great things will happen. And if the paper is rejected, very, very negative things will happen. The motivation is very, very strong. So one of the papers I, I mentioned in the uh, presentation is a paper that will be a published in the May issue uh, of Organizational Behavior and Human Decision Processes. In that paper, we offer motivation to editors to engage in more transparent practices that also will motivate authors. From the perspective of editors, many editors are thinking, but it's really hard to change the system. How am I going to change the system? It will take a lot of time, a lot of effort. How should I do that? 
Plus, maybe if I start publishing non-significant results, the articles in my journal will not be cited that much. So the impact factor will be reduced in my journal, and it will be the editor who will be blamed for the reduction in the impact factor of my journal. Again, the rewards and punishments of behavior. So in, in the paper, we said we can, we can implement a system in a journal where instead of submitting the full length paper with all the results and all the analyses, you submit something similar to a dissertation proposal. The theory, the research design, and the data analysis plan without the results. And if this is a high quality research study, the paper gets accepted or not, regardless of what you find. In, now, if in the end you collect data differently, you collect different variables, or the things you wanted to measure, you couldn't measure, that's a different story. But if you pretty much follow the same plan as in your proposal, the paper eventually gets accepted. So that's registered reports. Interestingly, we do that all the time with dissertations, all the time. And yet some editors will say, oh, I don't know if we should do that. It's such a different thing. No, we do it all the time. Every dissertation is like that. You get the proposal stage. If the research is seen as high quality in terms of design, you let the student go ahead and collect the data. And then when they come back, it's pretty much accepted, even if the results are not statistically significant. So I'm going to stop here. And, and I'd like to hear your reactions to this issue of, of research performance and the performance of editors, reviewers, and authors as, as caused by the abilities bucket and the motivation and see what, what are the things we could do about those things. I'll stop here and raise your hand if, you, if you'd like to contribute to this conversation, please. I, I don't want to interrupt, but um, we do have just a couple of other questions that are either in the chat box, and I know a couple of people have raised their hands. So once, or if no one wants to contribute or once we're done contributing, Herman, I can let you know, um, it looks like Carlos um, had the next question. So once we're wrapped up here, um, we can move on to the next one. Okay, so let's let's finish finish off this conversation of motivations and abilities and what I just talked about, proposals or journals. I'd like to get your reactions to that. As an author, would you be comfortable with something like that? As a, as, a, as an editor, would you be able would you be willing to take the risk and say I'm going to create a second track for papers that are like that? Yes, no, why, why not? Ernesto, are you, are yes. you clapping? No, yes, very, please, very, very, very quick. Um, with some other colleagues from other journals, uh, we are also exploring, uh, as you mentioned, new ways to disseminate our research. Uh, probably not in a very orthodox way, but um, I'm a board member also for a very interesting journal. It's, a, it's the a small brother of JVB, the Journal Business Venturing, Journal Business Venturing Insights. And we are exploring very, very interesting things like quick communications, uh, public, uh, publish no results. So I don't find nothing. And this is interesting. <laughs> Why you don't find nothing? Um, uh, discussions with three colleagues, three scholars around one topic, even if the positions are completely different, the richness of this discussion is, is very interesting to advance in the knowledge. And also that we are now exploring uh, the reverse way to do something uh, like in many natural science. We discover a phenomena. We don't have any idea what exactly happened here. We don't have any theory. We don't have any conceptual background. We, but we have something that we, we face uh, interesting. Just put the phenomena and next construct the theory. Next see what happened. Independent if we have or not have uh, data, in order to construct around that. This is a new way to think, and at least in management, and it is, it's, it's very interesting to see that these results, no? Great point, great point. So let me, let me go to some of the questions in the, in the chat box. Alberto asked, how can journals help the situation of allowing authors to report unsuccessful research projects? So that is, that is what Ernesto was talking about. Um, so the, how, how can we motivate the editor to publish uh, papers that say the effect was not found or 
or the hypothesis was not supported. So uh, in medicine, that's interesting because in medicine, if something doesn't work, you really want to know. Like right now, if, if a certain type of mask is not helping you keep the virus in or out, then you want to know that that mask doesn't work. But in, in management, I don't know if many famous management scholars were famous for saying something doesn't work. Um, so it, it's, the dynamics are a little different, a little different. But I think the issue of, of motivation is the right track. And Alberto says, how can we help editors? Meaning, how can we motivate them? And one motivation for editors, in which we wrote in the Organizational Behavior and Human Decision Processes paper, is that we have some cases, not a lot of data, data yet, but we described a few journals that started reporting things much more transparently and their impact factor has gone up a lot in the last three, two to three years. Only three or four journals. So this is not a very large study and it's mostly anecdotal. We don't have really solid data yet, but the worst fear of an editor is that if they start reporting things openly, transparently, and showing that things are not supported, their impact factor might go down. That's their worst fear. So far, we don't have any data whatsoever that may, may show that that's the case. So uh, we need to think about ways to motivate editors to try to change the way they think about these things. And that's why we wrote that paper in OBHDP. Okay, Alberto, would you like to follow up on that point? Thanks. No, I think it was uh, really responded with Yvette, Jose Ernesto's and, and your answer previously. Thank you. Okay. Now, Carlos asked about uh, what happens if our study has a second order late model, but most of the previous research has reported correlational based studies or just a few first order late variables for SEM based models. Okay. So here's a very technical, specific situation. Uh, where uh, you are showing a result that is more complex than previous results. But the general issue of what happens when your data or your results are different uh, from what has been published in the past, okay? Change is hard. Nobody likes to change. And uh, uh, Max Planck, the, uh, the German scientist said, theories do not die. The people who created the theories die, and then the new, new theories emerge. <laughs> because researchers are very, very invested in their theories. It's like kids, like children for them. Your theory, you've been working on this for 20 years, 30 years. And then some person shows up saying, your work is not good. You were wrong all along. Nobody likes that. It's a big, it's a big threat. But science is self-corrective, much more so than many other uh, types of knowledge. We do have the peer review process. We do have the peer review process. And if, if one journal rejects a paper, you can go to another journal. It's not the end of the world. So how do you challenge something that exists and that you find results are not consistent with that? The answer is quite uh, straightforward, which is you have to get a tremendous amount of evidence. So you can't just with one little study, with one little sample size, challenge 10 years of research that can be for you. You just can't do that. And this is why techniques like meta-analysis or papers that include four or five studies within the same paper have become more popular and they're very powerful. Because then, then the new data that you introduce are, are trustworthy. So to, to challenge something that is almost believed to be fact, you just, there's no way around to the fact that you will have to provide a lot of evidence for that. Uh, a lot of data, maybe a study, like I said, with a paper with four or five studies, different measures, one an experiment, maybe another one with archival data, another one maybe a computer simulation, uh, agent modeling and different methods, different measures, and then you keep on finding the same new result that challenges the existing result. That's a way that you can do that. Carlos, does, would you like uh, to add to that, please? Uh, no, no uh, thank you very much, Herman. Uh, it's very clear for me now. Thank you. 
Terrific. Uh, Yvette, uh, yes, dissertation proposals also require that you pass an ethics review. Absolutely, absolutely. So that could be uh, done through the review process, but also that's done locally um, at your uh, local university before you collect data with human subjects in particular, you need the approval of the IRB, the Institutional Review Board. That will be part of the, of the process as well. Uh, Oscar, if we start. In... So Oscar is talking about social, uh, so, social sciences, assumptions, and that's, that's a very, very good point. Uh, there are not only methodological and statistical assumptions. If you're, somebody mentioned the structure equation modeling, well, you need to have uh, normality of residuals or you need to have multivariate normality of residuals and, and, and uncorrelated errors. Residuals should not be correlated unless you specify it. And you have a bunch of uh, statistical assumptions that if you violate the assumptions, the, the statistical technique might not give you the results that, that are credible that because the technique breaks down. The technique is not able to analyze data with certain features that violate certain assumptions. But there are also conceptual assumptions. There are epistemological and ontological assumptions. And here's one of the gaps that we have, um, or the dichotomies that we have in the field of management between qualitative and quantitative research. In fact, if you read the, the call for papers for the, I know Mary did, for the Vancouver conference, um, the theme is broadening our sight and being able to step back and try to see all these dichotomies that we have in the field that are preventing us from adding value from our, with our research, our teaching. One of those dichotomies is qualitative versus quantitative research. And there are very different fundamental assumptions about reality, about the world, about how organizations are constructed, how organizations are thought about. Um, and, and that creates uh, differences in what methods to use in the role of the researcher. And in most papers, they are quantitative in particular in nature, those assumptions are not mentioned at all, at all. Uh, we go right into the measures, right into the research design, and we do not talk about our ontological assumptions in quantitative research. In qualitative research, that is, that is more common. So yes, there are many uh, untold and unspoken assumptions uh, that is, I think, also contributing to the lack of transparency of our research. Um, Oscar, would you like to add anything to that, please? No, it's just my point. If we sometimes uh, are asking for talk about some uh, issue and they ask, or expect that we establish a, a specific relation between two variables, but without this, the assumptions. So when they replicate or take our assumption or relation with variables without assumptions and try to apply that to a specific organization in an environment different from our research, they don't have the exact uh, results that they expect and then blame the research, not the circumstances or the assumptions for the work. <laughs> you're, so you're saying that sometimes you try to replicate, but the context is different and therefore that's why you're not able to replicate. Was that the point? Okay, yes, exactly, yes, yes. So. That, that's a very, very good point. Um, that's a very good point. Now, unfortunately, unfortunately, the issues that we have found in our field are not only about replication, like you mentioned, trying to do the same study in a different organization. And precisely because the organization is different, uh, the way you measure things are different, there are some other contextual factors that do not lead to the same results. But we also found lack of reproducibility, not just lack of replicability. Lack of reproducibility mean, means that you get the data from the previously published paper and you analyze the same data and you don't get the same results. And that could be because maybe the authors did certain things that they didn't disclose. Maybe they added another control variable in the model 
that was not published in the in the paper, so you don't know. Um, so that's that's a that's a real pr problem when you have lack of reproducibility. Um, but replicability is also a problem because in psychology, there is a big study in which they replicated psychology studies, and they called the authors of the original studies. And they ask them about their measures and their sample and the details of the procedures. So this is not an independent set of researchers who just read the paper and did the study. This is a set of researchers who work together with the authors of the original paper to make sure they did it as closely as possible. Now, is it exactly the same? No, but is, is it 99% the same? Yes, and if you have 99% or 90% the same, and listen, 50% of results are the same, then there's a problem, okay? But, but that's a very good point, Oscar. Uh, replications have to be examined very carefully to make sure we did exactly do exactly as in the original study. Otherwise, you don't know what's causing the difference. Good point, good point. Um, so uh, how do you pronounce your name, Leaf? Life. Life, life. Stood me light, uh, life. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I see you're in Europe because it's getting dark there, and some beer. Germany, garden. you you hit it quite. Uh, yeah, light, I knew, so. huh? Advice uh, in some beer garden there, in uh, life is enjoying life. Uh, so, uh, no, no, more or less. So, uh, what are your thoughts on education? Well, in fact, the Academy of Management right now is engaged in a couple of initiatives about that. Um, Recently, there's a, a partnership created with CARMA, the Center for uh, Applied Research Methods and Analysis, through which you can access uh, lectures on methods um, through the Academy Manager website. And I see a bunch of you going, yes, yes. So we are uh, trying to provide some of the methods, training, and doctoral education that many universities, unfortunately, because of uh, lack of budget, are not able to, to provide. So expect to see more and more of this in the future uh, we're forced now through the academy that we're doing today to go online so expect to see more of this um, sometimes out of the out of a crisis and those of you studying entrepreneurship know very well there's a lot of innovation and creativity that results from crises of course this is a terrible situation uh, terrible terrible situation but nevertheless we see some glimpses of innovation and creativity that are being created out of this crisis. So I expect to see more out of the economy in that domain, but we already have that karma initiative, okay? Um, I, uh, Carlos says I, uh, uh, that researchers must be experts in methods. Yes, and, and, and methods are becoming more and more complex. If you pick up an article from 10 years ago or 15 years ago, you will see that methods are quite simple compared to today. So, um, engineers who graduate about five to six, six years later, their knowledge is obsolete because technology goes so fast. Well, it's not quite like that for management researchers, but it's getting like that in the sense that what you learn in graduate school 10 years ago, 20 years ago is not enough today in terms of doing high quality, top-notch research. And the more you know methods, um, the, the, the better ideas you can have, more ideas you can have. For example, if you study uh, structural question modeling or meta-analysis or multi-level modeling, you can ask questions that you wouldn't think to ask if you just use regression. So the more methods you know, the more creative you become in terms of theoretical questions. There's a back and forth between methods and theory, okay? Um, we only have five minutes left, so I'd like to see if anybody would like to ask uh, a question. Otherwise, I'll go back to the to the chat box. Raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question. Okay, so um, question about software. Which software uh, I prefer? The answer is very easy. The one I know. <laughs> so if you know R, stick with R. If you know SPSS, if you know M plus, you know, learn one or two and just pretty much all of them offer the same tools these days. If you know Stata, that's it, use Stata. So whatever you know, stick with it. 
the learning curve is there is very steep very very steep so the best one is the one you already know um so we have to be open to other ways of generating evidence absolutely absolutely yvette asks a very good question and um there are many many ways and many things that enrich the human experience art architecture music those are beautiful things uh but unfortunately they're not science so if you want to do science there are certain criteria that you have to follow if you want to do other things that enrich the human experience that's fine but if you're not doing science then it, it cannot be called science it could be called something else and something else very valuable and very enriching but if we do science we need to understand that transparency is key replicability is key and trustworthiness and credibility are key not just needs to be pretty and sound good but it needs to be following certain scientific criteria otherwise it's something else just you know very valuable but it is not science and today we're talking about the credibility and replicability of science okay so we just have 30 seconds more to go i wanted to thank everyone um i i sincerely hope that you and all your loved ones are doing well. Uh, please uh, do your best to stay healthy and stay safe. And thank you so much for attending the session. And if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to email me. Uh, you can find my email address and also the articles we talked about at hermanaginnis.com. Thank you so much. And I look forward to seeing you soon. Bye-bye.